Hey, sisters in medicine. This is Dr. Me First, a podcast all about authentic conversations between us, female physicians. Through my conversations that I'm having with other female colleagues, I hope that I'm bringing you encouragement, inspiration, hope, and fun to your life and your practice. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Erin Wiseman, your colleague in medicine and your coach in life. And I hope that you realize that this is all about building community. No longer should any female physician feel alone in medicine because this is a place of truth speaking, life saving, and fierce females who want to support and lift each other up. Today's episode is episode number 31, and I'm talking with Dr. Linda Hodges. She is a fellow DO and triple board certified. Holy shit, guys, she is kicking ass and taking names. But the most amazing thing about this conversation is she gets really, really raw and real with me today. Her word is deserving. And she opens up about how at times she feels like she's the last one who is deserving. And so I hope that you take away some real true gems from this conversation. I know that I did. I was honored and humbled to speak with Dr. Hodges, and I just so admire the work that she's doing and the authenticity that she brought to this podcast. So stick around, listen to the conversation, and then afterwards get that kick of encouragement. Here we go. everybody. It's Dr. Wiseman back with a special guest today. This is Dr. Linda Hodges, and she is going to tell you guys all about herself. So I'm Dr. Linda Hodges. I'm a 2005 graduate of KCOM in Kirksville, Missouri. Um, I'm double boarded internal medicine, critical care, and then I also got my certification in obesity medicine in 2015. Um, I've been practicing since 2010, uh, critical care, and then in 2015, I opened my own independent um, obesity specialty clinic, and then in 2017, I opened a second clinic, um, and um, it is it, I specialize in ketamine infusions for refractory depression, PTSD, um, anxiety, as well as uh, some chronic pain infusions. So in addition to my critical care work, which is my real job, um, I have these two clinics on the side that um, I'm trying to maintain. Wonderful. Well, DO Power Unite. Me too. That's great. I love it when I get to talk to another fellow DO. I'm from Kansas City, so just down the road from Kirksville. Yeah. Uh, Well, great. You got a lot of eggs in the basket, it sounds like. I. I like everything. That, that's, I don't know. My husband thinks it's a fault. <laughs> it probably is a fault, but I really, really like everything. Yeah. Hey, my husband thinks the same thing about me. I'm always coming up with new projects or he's like, aren't you already got X, Y, and Z going? I'm like, yeah, let's add something else though. That's why we had three kids. Cause like two wasn't just quite enough. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, awesome. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not that adventurous. <laughs> not that adventurous. Well, I always tell everybody it's the three wise men. It just makes sense if you had three wise men children. So, but we're taking care of that business. We're shutting stuff down now. (laughs) Well, anyway, our word today that we're going to talk about is deserving. Tell me why you picked this word. Um, I picked this word because I struggle with it. So I wanted to have a conversation Um, well, I mean, first of all, I never take the easy way. It doesn't seem, but I I wanted to have a conversation about something that I might get something out of. And, um, this is something that I struggle with every single day as a professional woman, as just a female in general, probably. And I just kind of wanted to throw that word out there and kind of, um, initiate some thoughts in everyone's mind of as, female physicians, um, making probably an adequate income, juggling a whole lot of stuff, probably coming from a place where we met a lot of goals, maybe some perfectionism things, you know, what, what are we deserving of? What do we deserve in life? And do we go after it? And I find that I struggle with that a whole lot. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it, it goes back to looking in, inside and asking mm-hmm. ourselves, what do we deserve and why? Right. Because right. we are go-getters, you know, both of us can attest to that. Right. But and as the ultimate go-getter, we are the, also the ultimate, I don't want to say martyrs. I don't want to mean that, but we're the old, we're the first ones to put ourselves last. Yeah. We do self-sacrifice. Right. Literally self-sacrifice. And, and I, I think that's really telling for all of us that we would be the first one to step up for the plate for anyone except ourselves. Right. Right. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast a, a while back about when is the last time you broke a promise to somebody else? And I was just like, oh my gosh, that was just horrifying to even think about it. But then, you know, when was the last time you broke a promise to yourself? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, like four times already today. <laughs> so it's just, you know, a lot of those things we, and I don't think we consciously think, oh, I don't, you know, I don't feel like I deserve that. But I think that ends up what it, that ends up being what it truly is about. Just devaluing ourselves at the, you know, to put others ahead of us a lot of times. What do you think it is that, that brings that to the forefront, specifically in high achieving professional women? Um, I don't know if we set, um, I know that I set high expectations for myself and I, and I interpret, again, this is all me, but I interpret that I set those expectations um, for myself with others too. So if I do X, Y, Z for somebody, they're used to having X, Y, Z done for them. And therefore I can't take X, Y, Z away. And so once I set the bar with regards to my performance or my behavior or my giving or my availability, I have a hard time taking that back, whether it's professionally or personally. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of, one of my issues. Mm -hmm. I would think too, another question, just as we were talking about like putting ourselves last and, you know, breaking our own promises, like in what ways do you find that you like self-sacrifice yourself? Me personally? Sure. Um, oh my goodness. There's so many things, honestly. Well, it sounds like my life is terrible. My life is not terrible. I don't mean that a bit at all. Um, so just, it's little things over time. So working out the things that I should be doing, you know, to just to take care of myself in general. Um, you know, the kids all have their dentist appointments on time. I might go a year and a half. It's just one of those things that just doesn't get done. Um, the same thing with doctor's appointments, the same thing with um, trying to food prep my own stuff when I'm getting the kids stuff ready for the week. You know, just this, I feel like, um, you know, for example, when I was in residency, which was a long time ago, I would get up at 345 in the morning to work out because it was the only time I could do, I could have done it after at the end of the day, but that took time away from my family. So I chose to get, you know, four hours of sleep of not at night, get up at 345 and run so I could get it in. So I didn't take time away from them in the afternoons or the evenings or whenever I, I had that time because they're sleeping. I wasn't taking any time away from them. Um, I can't manage to do that anymore. <laughs> that four quite hours quite. of sleep hurts. But, um, you know, just, it's just all of the self care. I feel like that's the part that goes by the wayside. Um, honestly, for me personally, to the point where I don't even know what self care is a lot of times. Um, one of my nurses asked me the other day, you know, when do you, when do you just chill out and relax? And I was so confused. Like <laughs> was relaxing. Like, I don't even know what, what you're that? talking about. <laughs> Vegging? What is that? Like we are the queens yeah. of multitasking. Right. I didn't, I had no, no clue. Um, yeah, none. And then somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, you know, if you won the lottery and did not have to work, what would you, what would you do? And I, I think I went into AFib. I was like, oh my God, I, I what? 
What was the question? <laughs> I just had no, if I'm not doing everything, I, then I'm not, then I don't know what I would do. Yeah. And it sounds like maybe it comes back to, and I mean, I think it's a whole lot of things, but I think, I feel like so many times with, with the women that I work with, we are what we do. We, we base our value, our worth on what we're doing. And then it paralyzes us like, oh my God, what if I wasn't a doctor? Like that, like you said, like winning the lottery and not being a practicing physician anymore felt very like, get the, uh, um, cardism out and convert right. you out of AFib because <laughs> your heart was a flip flop in a little bit. Uh, yeah. I was, and I, I didn't know during the headlights, I did not know, even know what, how to answer that question. Yeah. Cause I think it comes back for so long that that is what we are. That is what was pounded into us. That is what the, the self-talk that we did to ourselves when in reality, it's who we are ourselves, you know, our internal selves, the, the contribution that we give to the world by just being us is what is deserving and what is worthy. And all the extra stuff we did, that's just living in our purpose. You know, that's just fulfilling the us in a, who we are. Because, and that's really hard to grasp, I think, as a working professional. I know that the first time I heard somebody say, it wouldn't matter what you do or who you are, it's who you are that counts. And I was like, fuck no, I'm a physician. That's what it's about. But the more that I've kind of pondered that question, like, what if everything went away? What if my diplomas got taken off the wall? What if, for God forbid, something happened to my licenses? You know, what if? Who would I be without those? I, th there you go. I, c I can't answer that. I, I know. And that's, that, I'll be honest, that's the struggle that I had for a very long time until I kind of came full circle and I said, well, I would be Aaron and that would be okay. And so it is a really hard journey. It is really big. And, but I think if we shirk away from those questions, then we never really get to the point of feeling like that we can, we can deserve things or we can demand things like self-care, like cutting out that time and saying, you got to be fine for 30 minutes. Mama's going to go hit the treadmill. Right. Right. Well, and remember though, deserving goes both ways. You know, you, you can deserve rewards, but you can also deserve punishments. And I think that we punish our, well, I know I punish myself a lot more than I, than I should for things that are, are silly. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you know, just, uh, I'm not going to buy that because I didn't meet a certain goal or, I mean, you can have goals and rewards, don't get me wrong, but just above and beyond what I think would be more of an appropriate, um, punishment, if you will. Or something that I did not achieve, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of times, oh, you know, I will withhold things from myself because I didn't do X, Y, or Z correctly or at all or enough or good enough to my standards. And so not, oh, I think, so I think the deserving goes, you know, do I, do I deserve to have this nice thing? Oh, do I deserve to punish myself? You know, the reward and the punishment are, you know, sometimes two sides of the same deserving coin. Absolutely. Yeah, that we can, we feel that we deserve punishment or des deserve having something withheld. Um, and I think that goes back to maybe like our internal talk. And uh, I'll be honest, I'm a recovering perfectionist. So a lot of times I have to check my thoughts. and remind myself that perfection is not attainable because, and you know, we all have a certain mind frame, what perfection looks like. And it's never, it's never, cause there's always a, that little zinger that comes in or something happens in life. And so I've taken on the mantra is good enough is really good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't have, I have no problems comparing to other people. I don't, I don't give two craps what anyone else does. It's all about comparing the, in, you know, the internal dialogue, comparing to myself, comparing my performance today to my performance yesterday. I am not above, you know, ordering 
my cupcakes for the bake sale. I don't get on Pinterest and look up crap. And if I do, I find pictures and then I send them to the baker, baker person. I don't, I'm not that person that competes with anyone else, but I compete with myself so badly. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I never win. <laughs> That's the thing. I don't think That's what I was going to say. Do you feel like that if you could go from competing with yourself to collaborating with yourself, would that maybe change the relationship of deserving? I don't know. Maybe it could. If I could think of it a little bit differently. Yeah, maybe it could. Kind of switching it a little bit and be like, hey, girl, we on the same team. Yeah. Gosh. You know, sometimes it does. I mean, we are our own worst enemies a lot of times, definitely. Absolutely. It's that space between our ears that, um, and I think a lot of our listeners can agree to this. It's like we're top of the top, you know, outwork anybody, um, outstudy anybody, you know, like, like we know our stuff, but our greatest enemy is ourselves. Most definitely. Yeah. I, I don't know if there is a, I'm sure there is a cure for that. I don't know <laughs> what it is, but um, I do know that for me personally, and probably for a lot of people listening, it just can't continue. Mm -hmm. And so, and that, and that's one of the reasons why I threw this out there is just, you know, how do you how do you recognize, you know, granted, I'm, I'm Linda, I'm a doctor, but I'm also Linda, I'm human, and I'm Linda, and I deserve this bubble bath, or I deserve a new outfit, or I deserve something that um, is a big deal to me, but other people seem to be spending money on hand over fist, and, and they have no problem with it, but yet I'm looking at it, and I'm going, oh my God, it's not even that expensive, but who, who I can't, buy, something I like can't that? afford that Instapot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's where I found a lot of help um, when I started myself getting coached because uh, it's, it's just not something that we're taught along the way anywhere. And so one really mm -hmm. cool exercise with life coaching is um, talking through those thoughts because our thoughts are linked to our feelings and emotions. Our feelings and emotions are linked to our actions. And then those actions, you know, then become repetitive habits in our outcomes. So if we can back the train all the way up and identify what are those thoughts, then we can affect everything downstream. Because actually there's a step even before thoughts. And that is like the facts. That's what I like to call it. The facts that happen in life. The things that can be proven in the court of law. Like it was 27 degrees today here in Indiana. You know, that is the fact. The thought behind it is, for me, I'm freezing my ass off so I don't want to go outside and run today. You know, because, and then that's the mm -hmm. thought. But really if you go back to the fact of the matter, it was like, it was cold. It was 27 degrees. And if you can morph your thoughts around that, oh, and, and instead of me saying, it's cold, therefore I don't want to go outside, I can say, it's cold, perhaps maybe I wait till the sun comes up or put on another layer of clothes, then I can modify all of that downstream. So I really think it comes back to being like, is this a fact or is this my thought that I'm getting at? Like, for instance, when you were in talking about, like, um, somebody else spending money on something when you're like, oh, my God, what's your thought in that situation? That, obviously, they deserve it, and I don't. Mm -hmm. What's the fact in that situation, though? <laughs> um, I, I don't know that there is one. The fact, the I don't know that I need professional help. Maybe that's the fact. No. Um. <laughs> the fact I think would be in that situation that it's an object that costs money. You know, it's, it's a, it's something they're buying. You know, that's right. the fact of it all. The thought that you're interjecting into that is they're spending money because they deserve it. I'm not spending money because I don't deserve it. Right. And so I think you have to modify that and just simply say it's somebody, you know, buying something and, and in your own mind, 
be like, I'm not buying that, not because I don't deserve it. I'm not buying it. And, and, you know, working around, well, why aren't you buying that? Or why, why do you feel like you don't deserve it? Kind of working those thoughts and those feelings around that. It's a really cool model um, who this came from. Um, it's, there's an acronym. I'll put it in the show notes for everybody or even attach the little picture with some of the exercises that go along with it because the thought model is to um, take it and, and shift it. But it's Brooke Castillo. She's the one that initially kind of came up with some of the stuff around it. And I think it's a really interesting thing. The other exercise that I think is really good to help with our own self-talk is we really need to bring awareness to how we let that voice in our head talk back to us, that dialogue that we're all having in there. Mm. And to see, is that dialogue one that you would have with your child or with your favorite pet or your best friend? Or is this a dialogue that you would have with like your mortal enemy or, you know, a more negative, I guess, connotation? Because really, We need to speak to ourselves as though it's the most loving relationship that we have in our lives. Like I said, with our child or best friend or or, our pet or our spouse, because there's no reason that we should be talking to ourselves more negatively than how we interact with other people. Right. Right. And, And I, yeah, that's something that I struggle with quite a bit. I'm sure a lot of people struggle with that. The, the inner, self-talk the the negative self-talk um especially when you're tired Mm -hmm. I mean you and I are tired we get tired a lot and it and I swear to god it's causing brain damage (laughs) but yeah it's so hard to to not it's so hard to be um to have a an appropriate perspective Mm -hmm. when we're already tired um and then we see things going on around us that that for me personally like, well, you know, why am I the only one that doesn't deserve? Or why am I the only one that feels that I'm, that I'm dealing with? Nobody else seems to have this problem but me. Mm-hmm. And I know that, that that's not real. When I'm rested and I can think correctly, I know that that's not right. But the times that I am already um, fatigued, you know, I've been up all night, you know, in the ICU or whatever, several nights in a row, and then I don't get good sleep during the day these things really, really snowball. And And I think, right. And so, and not everybody works overnight granted, but you know, a lot of people listening to this, they're going to have, um, you know, kids keeping them up, new babies keeping them up, or they're just going to have, you know, things piling on doing charts all through, you know, all into the late of the night. And so I think all of us are so fatigued and so tired that when these negative things start, and these, you know, I don't deserve this, or why am I, I must be the only one having this problem. Um, You know, the self-care, the rest, I think is a huge part of it. I don't know the solution for that. Um, Getting more sleep, getting more rest. And I also think, I was thinking about this earlier, something you said, you know, I don't see any of the same people that I went to medical school with. I think we become so isolated as women physicians as well as we progress along. And I think that that has affected me significantly. Um, I, you know, I can still text people, ask a question or, you know, how are you doing? The babies look cute on Instagram, whatever, but I'm not connecting with these people at all anymore. You know, that I went through two years of hell with. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And I miss that a lot. And I think that that has, really, really affected me emotionally as well um, and plays into this quite a bit. Yeah, that sounds like a really great point. Some things that I can maybe help cue into um, because, you know, just taking a nap doesn't fix it. Yeah, it makes you feel a little bit better. But I know exactly what you mean. You're like, we're going to be perpetually tired. It's just kind of, you know, it is what it is. But what I would check and say is having small like cue ins or cue cues somehow positioned in your life that kind of help bring you back out of the like muck of negativity. Because that's what it feels like to me when I get into those like 
dark cloud moments where everything is sucky and black and I hate it and it feels like I've rolled around in the mud and I'm just pissed. Mm -hmm. What I would encourage you to do and all of our listeners is find those things that help kind of cue you back. So here's some examples from my, my coaching business that I have had people um, tell me about in their own life and I can give you a few examples. One is like making a list, like on a post-it note or a piece of paper and hanging it somewhere where it, it's pretty common that you see it in your locker or on a mirror in your office or um, maybe something at home if you're home more or wherever you spend a good majority of time. But having a list of either why you do what you do, you know, what brought you into where you're at. Or reminding yourself, um, like centering yourself, you know, why are you deserving? Why are you important? Why are you special? Making this list, of course, when you're in a good state of mind, so that when you're in a bad state of mind, it cues you back. Some people, it's pictures of their kids, their families, maybe a significant place in their life that when they see it, that cues them back. Some people are more, um, so those for like verbal or for visual people, some people are more auditory, so they need some sort of sounds or music or something that kind of helps bring them back. So you guys are all going to laugh at me. I'm very much a like auditory. I think it's my or olfactory. I, my superpower is smell. Even then like when I'm pregnant, I have like the super hound nose. So what I did when I was in the office and my nurse would laugh at me because she would know that I was having a rough day because I would switch on my Scentsy candle so that this would bring the smell into the room, uh, into my office. And then it would kind of drift into exam rooms for me. But that would kind of like just get some goodness in and kind of recenter me and refocus me and be like, life is not as bad as what it feels like right now. It's just how it's feeling right now. Just stay here in the moment. Remember life is okay. Life is good. You, you're doing fine. You are a smart, good doctor and keep putting one foot in front of the other. That's what my, and I think it was like pumpkin spice or something. So now when I smell pumpkin spice, it re recenters me. Other people will do um, different types of movement. Um, you know, we'll have a certain cue or something. So just these small little things that can kind of help bring it back. Is it going to fix the situation? Hell no. But at least it's going to get you in a better frame of mind to be able to like in that moment at 3 a.m. <laughs> in the doctor's lounge after you've been all up taking care of everybody who's crashing in the ICU at that point. Right. It can bring you back around to that. And then I think the other point where you're talking about is like reforming that network of those people that you did. You, you went through hell and back again with them. I mean, you have super special bonds and just how life kind of pulls us in all different directions, really working on having just, you know, starting with one good connection with somebody and calling them and saying, Hey, I need to, we need to talk sometime if they're not like in your region that where you can like sit down and have coffee with them and just getting really real with them and saying, you know, as if, it had been a couple of years ago and getting support from them. I call it an accountability shoulder because it's somebody that you can cry on, but it's also somebody who kind of go mm, give you that right. push when right. you need it too. And I think that's so important. And I think for people who feel like they've drifted too much from other colleagues or they don't know where that accountability shoulder is. Honestly, that's where I found a life coach that was so super helpful in my own life that became that accountability shoulder until I, you know, got my head back into the game and got some things straightened out and helped out with it all because I think it's essential to what we're doing to, to live a well-lived life, to have those elements and those people who can be that accountability shoulder for us. Right. No, that that's, yeah, that's good. I, I don't know if you have, before you got the coach, but I feel like medicine has, you know, just kind of infiltrated my being to the point where there's so many of those, whether it be social skills or um, self, you know, self-care skills. I mean, it's just like, I can sit back and go, 
oh, remember when I used to do that? Why don't I do that anymore? What happened to me doing that? You know, and it was something that was a big part of my life. And then I have just completely forgotten about it, you know, or um, I used to color a lot. I love the smell of crayons. And it, that's one of the things that, that relaxes me like crazy. And um, I, I don't do it. And so the other day I was thinking, oh my gosh, I have not done that probably in three or four years. What made me stop doing that? Mm-hmm. And probably I took on something else that once again infiltrated my being and just just stopped it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to to work that back in sometimes. It takes a while. I mean to like because once we kind of stop we we let our boundaries down, things kind of start encroaching into our lives that we don't evidently want. But that's the thing about boundaries too, is it helps us keep things that we want in our lives. So I'm a good old farm girl. I've built enough fences in my life to know that, you know, your fence is just not always about keeping things out, but it's also about keeping your flock, keeping yours inside of your boundary too. And I think that's where we all have to at times step back and be like, okay, looking at my calendar, what am I dedicating my time to? Because you can swap out the word time for priorities. So looking at it, you're like, okay, so this piece, you know, mine's on my phone. So looking at my calendar on my phone, what are those priorities? And are are those really lining up with who I am? Because if they're not then it's time to have a realignment. And I think that's the big thing to remind ourselves. It's you're not a failure if, you know, things have drifted in or drifted out that you didn't want it. You're only a failure if after you recognize it, you don't make those changes that you see in your life. And so one really cool thing that um, I picked up a couple months ago is instead of saying, oh, I don't have time for that. It's like a cue to say, wait, it's not a priority. And if that fits, then it's like, oh yeah, it's not a priority. So I don't have time for that. But then like the coloring, you're like, no, that's kind of a little bit of a priority for me or exercising or, you know, getting an extra two hours of sleep. That's kind of a priority for me. So then it's looking at the other things that are in your schedule so that you can, you know, you've got to get rid of some to put some in. Right. Yeah. I used to have a, one of my, one of my college professors used to always say um, that, well, in life is like this, but he would say the brain is like a, like a um, parking lot and for more cars to come in, some stuff has to go out. And I would always joke, well, you know, like right now I'm taking up all the disabled spots and (laughs) we're doing an expansion over here. The car that knew my name just left and the car that knew my kids' names just pulled out. (laughs) And so, but yeah, I mean, life definitely is like that. And I think too, like sometimes we have to give things up and it hurts. I mean, it really does. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, I kind of, I kind of liked being the medical director at such and such facility, but yet, you know, it's not, it doesn't trump something else in your life. And so Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge that too with people that this is not an easy process and this is not a pain-free process, but if you then get to a point where you're doing the things that are fulfilling you that are bringing you joy that you're like, Oh, I really did like doing X, Y, Z. And yeah, I miss that what I used to do, but I'm in a better place now Then you obviously did the right choice. Right. Right. And everything in life has to be triaged, obviously. Um, but you know, when somebody like probably you and I, when we want to do all the things, it's, it's super hard. I remind myself too of seasons because I, I am the same way. Like I like to pile, you know, everything up. And since I break it down into seasons, then that reminds me, like, for instance, I mentioned my three kids, you know, when you have that newborn and you have the two-year-old and the four-year-old, like it's just not the season that you're going to be able to take like a 14 hour family vacation, Aaron, even though you tried to do that. (laughs) I I always have to learn the hard way. But that's, but no, that's really good. Yeah, that's. But that doesn't thinking. mean that we won't come back around to it, you know, later on. It's just it's not the season for it. It's not the place for it. And if it's really something that's super important to me, then there's a way to find a workaround. There absolutely is. Now it's probably going to take some more energy, some more time, some more money. Like 
instead of doing that 14 hour van ride, you know, let's hop on a plane and do the three hours with the kids in the plane. Still not as fun, but we got there quicker type of thing. But that really helps me when I start to feel overwhelmed because I've, I want to do everything. Like the urgency feels like, no, this has to happen right now. Yeah. And it's like, wait, is it, is it this season yet? Right. No, that, that's good. I had never thought of it that way. That's really good. Because I do, I do feel that sense of urgency with almost everything that comes into my life. Um, yeah, the flip, the switch is either on or it's off. Yeah, my yeah, husband laughed at me because so where I totally hate it, and then I have to turn it off again. <laughs> yeah, my husband laughed at me because when we first started dating, we used to take jet skis out on the lake here in Indiana, and he's like, "You have two settings: either pedal to the metal or you're off." And I'm like, "That's just how." And so I've had to learn to live half throttle. Like, what does that feel like in my life? Um, and actually, it's not too bad. But I, I am always fighting that instinct to like hammer down, you know, get it done, push through, fight through that wall. When and sometimes it's like, okay, half throttle, Aaron, half throttle. Yeah. Yeah. I should, I don't even know how to do that, but yeah, I need to. <laughs> well, we're going to get you some coaching after we get off of here on this podcast. But if our listeners want to hear about what you're doing um, with your clinics, you mentioned you had a book. Why don't you tell them all about that right now? So, yeah, the book um, just got finished about a month and a half ago. Um, right now it's an ebook, but it's being formatted for Kindle and um, Amazon. So when I opened my weight loss clinic, the the book started out basically – taking my service and turning it into a product to reach more people. However, since starting the endeavor, I got the clinic got to the point where I just couldn't from a time perspective, could not take on any one-on-one -on -one patients anymore. It just, I, it wasn't, it just wasn't working out with time with family. Um, when, and I'd started the ketamine clinic and that was getting super busy. So as I wrote the book, it actually, morphed into what I like to call almost a pre-diet diet book um, because I found myself still to this day with my weight loss patients. I have the same conversations um, with them multiple times a day. It's And this has been for three and a half years now. So I ended up writing the book basically about the mindset work that needs to be done before you even embark on a weight loss journey. You know, like we, you know, I, I talk about, I'm so the person to talk about this, obviously, and since I have no negative self-talk, <laughs> kidding. We are our own teachers. Believe me, everything that comes out of my mouth is like, needs to be reflected back to me. Right. Go not on. I say, not what I do. Um, so it goes into just all of the, the inventories that we need to take on our, within our own selves before we decide to, um, to do a paleo thing or to do a keto thing or to sign up for a meal replacement thing. I mean, what, you know, looking at what worked for you in the past, looking at where you are in your life, looking at if your um, income affects your grocery shopping, all of these things go into, and a hundred more things go into whether a weight loss program is going to be successful or not be successful. And so we can try, you know, what our sister tried who lost, you know, 35 pounds in two days all day long. But it's, if it's not going to work for you, your income, your lifestyle, your travel schedule, your work schedule, your postpartum, you know, status, then it's not going to work. And it's going to be one more failure that's going to weigh heavily on your mind. So, you know, the book goes into hacks, you know, how to survive social things. It goes into why we um, gain more weight back that, than we lost. So some of the sciencey stuff about weight loss and understanding how it works to try to get you through plateaus and small setbacks. And so it's, like I said, it's a kind of a pre-diet diet book because I, want, I wanted it to be, I want people to be in the right place before they even decide to lose weight. Um, because making the lifestyle commitment to get healthier is just that it's a lifestyle commitment. I mean, you don't go out one day and be like, 
oh, hey, I met this guy in the mall. I'm getting married this afternoon. You don't just make a decision for the rest of your life in five minutes, but that's how we approach our weight loss. And it just, there just needs to be so much more pre-work than that. And so that's what the book is about. And it comes with homework and worksheets, you know, some things to, to work through. Um, in addition to goes over all kind of different diets. It doesn't tell you what to do. It basically just says, here's where you need to be. Here's what's possible. Now, looking at all of this stuff that you've done, what, what looks like the most appropriate choice for you? Right. So Setting them up good. Well, I'm the queen of worksheets, so that like gets me all excited when I hear homework and worksheets. So yes. what's the title of the book? Um, the title is Weight Loss That Works, Secrets to Restoring Confidence and Reclaiming Your Body. Beautiful. And I will put that in the show notes for everybody um, to, so they can look it up. Awesome. And are you hanging out on social media? I can be found. Um, I have a Facebook page. The clinic's Facebook page is Exceptional Health and Weight Loss Solutions. My Website is exceptionalweightloss.com. And then all of my social media stuff is Dr. Healthy Weight, DR, and then Healthy Weight. Beautiful. Except on Peloton. If you follow on Peloton, I'm not Dr. Healthy Weight. Oh, you're, you're in that, aren't you? <laughs> I am Doc Mom Tired AF on Peloton. <laughs> That's like becoming a serious thing. I'm I'm getting kind of interested in this. I may have to jump on with you and and get the bike. It's it's nice. I'm glad it was one of my better better decisions. Definitely was it. I have yet to meet anybody who says that it wasn't a great decision. So yeah. I'm in that pre contemplation stage. Talk about pre diet diet. I'm in yeah. pre plant on plant on stage. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I hope that this conversation between what between us has been as intriguing to our listeners as it has been to me. Told you it was a super good one, right? Uh, I've listened back to that conversation and I just take so many nuggets. One from Dr. Hodges and two some of the incredible things that I say that I don't even realize I say sometimes. So I hope that you got as much out of it too. So for your kick of encouragement, I want to give you my list of what to do when everything is awful and I'm not okay. I recently was listening to a podcast with Dr. Katrina Ubell and um, she mentioned this list. And since that point, I have really taken it to heart. So here it is the top 11 things you should do when everything is awful and you're not okay. One, drink some water. Just get you a good size cup, fill it up halfway at least and drink it. And then fill it up again and drink it a little bit more, some more water. It seems like we're all always deficit and sometimes it's just what our body needs. Two, think about the last time that you ate something and get some food. Now, not any of that like crappy, you know, donuts from the doctor's lounge, anything like that. I mean, some quality snacks, something that's going to really fuel your body rather than just get you on a sugar high. Three, take a shower. There's something about jumping in the shower that makes you feel so much better. Just that cleansing process can change your whole demeanor. Quick story on this the other day. I was just feeling really grouchy and really upset and it was like 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And I just jumped in the quick shower and when I got out, God, I felt so much better. So do number three. Four, stretch your legs. This may be just taking a walk around your neighborhood. It may be just going through some quick yoga vinyasas. It may just be stretching. Maybe you just need to get up and move around. Maybe it's actually doing an exercise routine that you typically do or lifting weights. But just get up and stretch. Get your blood moving. Get your heart pumping. Get some energy out of your body. Number five, do something nice for someone else. This is a way to flip that negative attitude and try to radiate some of that energy in somebody else's direction in a positive way. It can be a nice note. It can be just some words of encouragement. It can be more for that. It could be buying pizza for the people you work with for lunch just because. But try doing something nice for someone to get you out of your funk. All right, number six, move to some music. 
get your phone out, whatever player you use, hit shuffle, and dance to the next song. There's something about getting up and moving your body to the rhythm of whatever music comes on that can really shift you out of a shitty mood. Number seven, talk to your person. We all need a person. I'm a huge Grey's Anatomy fan, the early seasons, not the late ones. But do you remember when Meredith and Christina were talking and she was like, you're my person? We all need to have that in your life. So maybe it's a friend, a family member. You know, I'm here for you as a coach. I love being people's persons, that person that they can call when things are not going right. So if that's something you need, get a hold of me. Number eight, get dressed, get ready, and look what you feel like is attractive. When we wear slouchy clothes all the time, clothes that don't fit, scrubs that were made for people who are shapes of boxes, it can really put a downer on our mood. So actually get up and get dressed in something that you feel good about can definitely lift your mood. Number nine, when's the last time you slept? Guys, seriously, I think we all know that sleeping is so important and yet hardly any of us get the amount of sleep that we actually need for our bodies. Maybe it's time that you seriously take a half day so you can catch up on sleep or at least get a few extra hours in when the house is quiet and in a dark place. Really evaluate your sleep habits. They most definitely are contributing to your down moods. And number 10, do something effective. And what I mean by that is so many times we go through our days, we get things done, we get things done, and at the end of the day, we feel like we've not done anything but just spin our wheels. So actually sit down and think about where you did things that were effective in your day. You got your kids up and to school on time. You got yourself to work. You saw half a million patients. You took care of things. You were very effective in your day, but you're not appreciating that. So actually look at that. So that's my top 10 things to do when everything is awesome and you're, everything is awful and you're not okay to make everything is awesome and that you are okay. Because if you go through that list of 10 and get all of those done, I guarantee you're going to feel better without having to be on medication. So I hope that you find this helpful. Remember, I'm here for you. And always, your life, your calling, your pulse matters. Did you know that currently this podcast is just about at 2,000 downloads in two and a half months? That means several hundred of us are coming together and hearing these conversations each and every time I drop episodes. When I think about that, it's just utterly amazing. And here's a shout out to all you in Texas. Right now, you are leading the market in downloads, so keep it up. But here's the thing. I need help to grow my reach. I would really love to have you seriously consider supporting this podcast by sponsoring an episode. So there's a link in the show notes to check out how to become a sponsor of a particular episode here on Dr. Me First. And with the sponsorship, they're going to be different than other podcasts. You know, other podcasts is more commercially. I would love the support and sponsorship of this podcast to be a shout out to a colleague, to spread inspiration by telling about something amazing that you're doing in your life or business or practice, sharing a silly story or joke to bring some more fun into our lives, something like that, that brings encouragement, inspiration, hope, and fun. Whatever it is, I would love to partner with you to make this podcast better. So head to my website via the link in the show notes and sign up to be a sponsor of an episode just one time. Super easy, very inexpensive, and it will be totally tailored to this fun, energizing idea. So think about it, pop on over, and if you have any additional questions, just email me at erinwiseman at gmail.com. Oh, 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 oh